every organization and its managers need to look both back to their histories as well as forward to their predictable futures in order to understand the dysfunctions and challenges they confront now and are likely to confront on into the future and the possible benefits that might come from successfully dealing with these dysfunctions and challenges. Only in this way can organizations and their managers gain the knowledge they need to become agile enough to succeed. Obviously, the world and its economies have changed dramatically in the last 50 years. Some of it for the better and some of it for the worse and continuing human challenges and grievances. Not only are global economies transforming, but so also are whole societies and the aspirations of their peoples. Since the 1960s, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of absolute poverty with a global absolute poverty rate in income having fallen from 52% of the population in 1981 to less than 10% in 2015. Just over half of the world's 7.3 billion people can now be classified as upper or middle class. At the same time, in recent years, as many as 60 million people worldwide have become refugees every year, trying to escape war, starvation, and death in their native countries. However, this has in turn created or exposed a new set of major challenges. Growth has been uneven between and within countries and explained often mostly by the rapid growth of Asia led by countries such as China and India. Even so, many countries, indeed regions, remain heavily dependent for their well-being on situations like the vagaries of the commodity markets. Commodities may in fact provide the only sources of revenue for these countries and regions. Some countries have the commodities, some need and or want them, and only some seem to have the resources to acquire them and thus can afford the development so strongly sought. Adding to the difficulties for many countries as they work to develop is the seemingly increasing confrontation of more frequent and severe weather events, such as droughts, floods, major storms, which disrupt agriculture and lead to problems with starvation and local wars and civil disturbances, which displace millions of people and overwhelm relief agencies. Countries with growing young populations are struggling to create meaningful educations and jobs for their useful generations. At the same time, with the information and communications revolutions informing everyone of better lifestyle possibilities and the emergence of distance and networked education, people's aspirations and dreams are rising rapidly. Issues like climate change continue to threaten the survival of many communities and countries, to say nothing of the overall threats these issues pose to our planet more broadly. In many ways, global governance and international institutions, to say nothing of the abilities and commitments of national governments, appear ill-suited for the tasks ahead. The following are a dozen global megatrends that I believe will affect the long-term economic and social prospects of all countries, rich and poor, big and small, and all organizations in the near future. Every country, every company, and every manager should think about how it can use or react to each of these 12 challenges and trends in ways that will move toward beneficial results 
for everyone. First, let me mention demographics. Most specialists place this issue first on their list of critical problems. By 2050, the world will have some 9.7 billion people as compared to 7.3 billion in 2015. Over half of the net increase will be in Africa. All regions of the world, including Asia, will have aging societies and declining populations, except for Africa and the Middle East. This sharp divergence in the demographic trends, aging and shrinking populations versus young and growing populations, combined with difficulties in creating jobs and providing education for Africa's and the Middle East bulging youth populations, will pose unprecedented challenges to the global community. The world will either need to learn to live with the diversity of the young growing populations, coupled with the aging and eventually shrinking populations, or accept large-scale immigration to deal with worker shortages in some locations and unrest in other locations. Second, I want to address the issue of global poverty. As argued by Hans Rosling, a Swedish scientist and physician who spent his life studying the nature and consequences of extreme poverty, but who passed away in February of 2017, the world has changed. He states that, for example, the number of births per woman worldwide has dropped dramatically over the past few decades, and average life expectancy, 71 years, is now closer to that of the country with the highest, Japan at 84, than the lowest, Swaziland at 49. He reasons that experts cannot solve major challenges if they do not operate on facts, but too often they operate on the basis of incorrect preconceived ideas and biases. Rosling continues to make the point that it is extreme poverty that produces diseases. It's where Ebola started. It's where Boko Haram hides girls. And it's where Konzo occurs. Ultimately, he says, eliminating extreme poverty is the only way to cure Konzo and prevent other maladies, both social and infectious. Thus it is money, the lack thereof, politics, the refusal to accept that extreme poverty is the problem, and culture that underlie disease in many, if not most, circumstances. And companies and countries confronted with disruptions stemming from the consequences of extreme poverty will all have to develop strategies that take these issues into account. Rosling came to appreciate that it was important for governments and relief agencies to grasp the nature of extreme poverty. Too often the poor are viewed as almost everyone in the developing world, an arbitrarily defined territory that includes nations as economically diverse as Sierra Leone, Argentina, China, and Afghanistan. Third, I want to look at the theme of urbanization. The rapid growth of cities and urban centers has become one of the most important trends. The pace of urbanization will continue to accelerate as the share of the world's population living in cities continues to steadily increase. As recently as the year 1950, as little as 30% of the world's population lived in cities. A century later, that will be flipped. 
By 2050, it is expected that 70% of all people will live in cities. The management consulting firm McKinsey estimates that the top 600 urban centers generate an incredible 60% of the world's total GDP. They also found that the world's largest 123 cities generated an astonishing $36 trillion in GDP per year in 2015. And this will just continue to grow. Thus, fast urbanization creates huge challenges for governments and companies. A majority of the world's population has lived in an urban setting since the year 2007. And the trend of migration from rural areas to urban centers will continue at least until 2050. Of course, fast growing cities create all sorts of problems and challenges, including the need for improved infrastructure, such as waterworks, sewers, roads, electricity, transportation, jobs, schools, dealing with natural disasters, serving the needs of the growing population, etc. The cities that are able to spread people's interaction across their entire populations are the ones that grow the best and fastest. That's because cities are not just places to live. They are also places to be employed or to work and to experience having a new job and learning new skills. And as we know, two-thirds of the economic development and economic growth of cities is determined by their population flow. Migration is an incredibly important part of how a city develops. Cities that are not able to attract and retain talent or migrants shrink, and opportunities for new businesses and startups and entrepreneurialism attract talent and migrants. If we look at the major cities worldwide, they're all migrant hubs, whether it's New York or London or Los Angeles or Shanghai or Beijing. Internal migration is as important as cross-border migration. The next yet related trend I want to describe involves evolving globalization and international trade. Since World War II, most if not all aspects of life have become increasingly international, including travel, commerce, economics and finance, education, food, music, work and workforces, air and water pollution. You can make your own list based on your own personal knowledge and experiences. Many of us, because of our personal and work experiences, have developed global mindsets. That is, seeing events from a global perspective, even maybe viewing ourselves as internationalists and judging personal experiences through a global prism, as contrasted to merely viewing events and news through a purely national lens. Even so, The Economist magazine has quite recently pointed out that to at least some extent, globalization may be retreating, with at least some large multinationals appearing to be returning to their countries of origin, particularly if tax incentives are being offered. The costs of long distance management and transportation are now being seen, at least in some cases, as larger than the benefits of lower labor costs in foreign locales. 
as a side but related concept, innovation and growth is increasingly being seen primarily in local and smaller firms rather than in global firms. And on a personal level, because of increasing nationalist political pressures, some people are expressing dissatisfaction with the perceived benefits of globalization anyway. Continued globalization of trade and investment will lead to an even more intertwined world. As East Asia has amply demonstrated, a prudent embrace of globalization can accelerate productivity and GDP growth and facilitate convergence with global best practices, but it can also cause painful disruptions as well, requiring careful national policies as well as a truly open and fair trading system. On an individual and societal level, in spite of so many global problems, such as water and air pollution, massive immigration and refugee problems, international investment, increasing cross-border relocations and travel for school and work and tourism, and costly preferred living conditions, many people still learn to enjoy the benefits and enrichment of living a modern global lifestyle. So this may need to be cut back as some countries and companies cut back their globalization. However, the rising flow of people, goods, services, and information across borders has been one of the defining powers of our time. It's a force that has endured through boom and bust and through political and financial crises. Even so, some major corporate executives, like Jeffrey Immelt, the CEO of General Electric, which has 420 factories in dozens of countries around the world, have said that they see an end to this era of globalization. In the face of rising protectionist sentiment and the erection of barriers to the import of goods manufactured outside, companies may have to look at localizing production where possible and or relevant. Many of the world's banks have already reduced their overseas operations. What is happening is likely the emerging of a new global economic order to replace the one that has existed since the end of World War II. It is likely that for the foreseeable future, the global economy will be defined by a complex and continuously shifting set of economic relationships. This next trend, globalization of finance, involves a continuation of the former trend toward larger, more global, and integrated markets. This will create more opportunities and could act as a positive force for economies with well-functioning financial systems. But even for them, it will create new risks and volatility that will need careful management. Further fundamental reforms of the global monetary, financial, and taxation systems and institutions are likely and necessary to prevent reoccurrences of costly global financial crises such as the world experienced in 2007-2008. The U.S. dollar has been the currency used in global commerce largely because the U.S. economy has been the world's largest and most stable economy. But this is changing. Some countries are now questioning whether other currencies, such as China's renminbi, might also serve as the global currency, or at least be a computing currency. Obviously, these sorts of issues will impact the banking system and all individual countries and banks. And cities such as London and New York that have been the centers of international finance, with most of the world banks located there, may find themselves competing for financial resources with major cities located elsewhere, such as Beijing and Shanghai, Tokyo, Singapore, Frankfurt, Hong Kong, Seoul, Dubai, and Sao Paulo. The next trend involves the before-mentioned rise 
of emerging economies and the resultant emergence of a massive middle class. Most media attention today works from an assumption that the development of the emerging economies is a modern phenomenon. But in reality, there are many examples from earlier times in history, even before the advent of city-states and countries as we now know them. For example, Greece and Rome, and the later colony-based powers such as Islam, Portugal, Spain, and England. Some characteristics of importance to these emerging economies today include the following. Developing economies account for over half of global output, 55% in purchasing power parity terms. This is a total reversal from the G7 economy's share of global output of as much as 57% as recently as 1960. From a U.S. perspective, even the U.S. economy is no longer the only driver of global trade. As Fred Smith, CEO of FedEx, was recently quoted as saying in Business Week magazine, 95% of the world's consumers aren't in the United States. So it is critically important for companies to recognize the true nature of global economies to determine their global strategies. In addition, and as indicated earlier, since the 1960s, this rapid development of at least some developing economies has enabled hundreds of millions of people to be lifted out of absolute poverty. This trend is a natural outcome of the continued and inclusive global economic growth. By 2050, 84% of all people in the world will probably belong to the upper or middle class. The emergence of large middle classes can potentially be a powerful positive force for economic and social development. But the existence of large middle classes will also add pressures on political leaders to keep their promises, deliver concrete results, and be held accountable, to say nothing of the consequent need to provide the infrastructure required to support a middle class lifestyle. The next trend I want to describe concerns the growing competition for finite natural resources, a natural outgrowth of the pressures stemming from the prior trends. Under the central challenges of these trends, by 2050, people in as many as 84 countries, more than a third of all countries, could enjoy income levels equal to or higher than those of Southern Europe today. The fundamental question is whether the Earth can sustain the demands of the resulting 4 billion or more new upper and middle class consumers, particularly if they choose to replicate the current lifestyles of Western consumers, or even if they would rather choose to move to more frugal lifestyles that would demand less from the Earth. It isn't likely that such consumers would accept fewer power plants, highways, railroads, high-rise buildings, manufacturing plants, stores, restaurants, schools, and other components of modern lifestyles. And thus, this trend will continue to demand ever-increasing provision of the resources needed. Of course, the concern also is whether there are enough natural resources to provide for this lifestyle and that there is a way to clarify who controls them. The next issue I want to discuss involves the increased awareness, acceptance, and experience of the consequences of climate change. This is possibly the greatest global common threat of our time. Its resolution is in the enlightened self-interest of all countries, including all developed as well as all developing countries, and requires cooperative global efforts. Global warming, while harmful to all, will cause the most economic damage to the poorest countries in Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. But the cost to the developed world to develop sustainable alternative energy sources, to replace the fossil fuel sources that create the major causes of global warming, and to deal with the many consequences of climate change 
will also be incredible. The next trend involves technological progress and breakthroughs that will combine to confront organizations and their managers with some of the most critical sources of challenge in the near future. New technology constantly offers tantalizing prospects of solutions to many current and emerging societal problems, including climate change, energy and food security, medical care for all, including the elderly, and provision of services to the bottom billion. One aspect of this issue that will impact everyone and every organization will be the resultant need to focus on planning efforts for jobs of the future. Occupations that are predicted to grow over the next five to 10 years, primarily jobs requiring data analysis skills and what is now often referred to as jobs in the gig economy. Many, if not most people working in some sort of part-time or contract job. Most organizations already report major difficulty recruiting for these positions. And obviously, most also anticipate ongoing, if not increasing, problems filling these positions in the future. Related to this is what is happening in the new world of innovation. The geographic footprint of innovation is changing dramatically as research and development programs become more global. An overwhelming 94% of the world's largest innovators now conduct elements of their R&D programs abroad, that is, outside the home countries of the major innovators. These firms are shifting their innovation investment to countries in which their sales and manufacturing are growing fastest and where they can access the right technical talent. Customers and technical research talent are increasingly found almost all over the world. And this is a trend which will only continue and probably at an accelerated pace. Not surprisingly, innovation spending has boomed in China and India. Collectively, in fact, more R&D is now conducted in Asia than in North America or Europe. For firms looking to the future and sensing the need to react to disruptive patterns in R&D spending, knowing where the technical talent is located or wants to live and where other firms are locating may be critical for developing strategies for innovation and marketing success. As Philip Courier, Chief Innovative and Strategy Officer at France-based telecom giant Alcatel-Lucent, which specializes in IP networking, ultra-broadband access, and cloud technology indicates one of the lessons they've learned over the years is that innovation does not have borders. He further observes they need to be careful because the next generation of disruptive technology will not necessarily come from the same place as the last one. In my next to last trend, I suggest the emergence of fundamentalism and non-state actors as one of today's major disruptors and a problem area that may change in terms of the major players, but isn't likely to go away anytime soon as an ongoing problem. Interesting, at least to me, there have been examples of this throughout history, but certainly as an issue, it is a central player in today's history as well. Violent non-state actors do pose potential serious threats to global security and rule of law, to say nothing of their threats to the operation of commercial enterprises. Thus, concerted cooperative global and local actions are typically urgently needed, together with an all-out effort to promote higher and more inclusive economic growth. The last of the trends that I want to mention although I've mentioned it a few times already in coordination with other issues, is the nature and impact of migration. As has been stated earlier, at least 60 million people were displaced annually in 2014, 2015, and 2016 due to national civil wars, large-scale terrorism, and major economic dislocations, often due to long-standing natural disasters. These are records. 
such large-scale involuntary migration is atop the list of the top five global risks of highest concern for the near future, according to the World Economic Forum in 2016. And because of the widespread impact of this huge amount of migration, every government and economic organization, global and local, will have to pay close attention to the current and possible future ways in which this will influence their operations. In summary, the 12 global megatrends I have described in this module should establish a solid framework for developing your organizational agility. This will be increasingly crucial as global dynamics continue permeating our lives and our society. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Let's now go to module two of this program.